2016 might go down in history as the year that the shortcomings of the criminal justice system became a social media phenomenon. And that's in thanks, at least in part, to the man who defended convicted murderer Stephen Avery, the subject of Netflix's runaway hit, Making a Murderer. Dean Strang has spent over 30 years defending the accused in Wisconsin's courtrooms as a public defender, as the state's first federal defender, as assistant United States attorney, and shareholder in two prominent criminal defense firms and founder of his own, including Strang Bradley in Madison. He's also, by the way, a terrific writer, and you should check out his excellent biography of Clarence Darrow. So we're delighted that he's here today. Uh, please welcome Dean Strang. Well, so at least half of us in this theater, I suspect, are hypnotized by making a murderer. And uh, before we talk about other things, we have to talk a little bit about making a murderer, obviously. So what attracted you to take on Stephen Avery's case? Well, um, he was easily the most high-profile, detested person in Wisconsin uh, <laughs> after he was arrested uh, for a murder. He'd been um, quite well-known for the two years before that, after he was exonerated from an earlier wrongful conviction, and he had been embraced by politicians, um, opinion leaders in the state, and held up as an example of a reason for reform. And so the fall from grace was really very dramatic um, for Stephen. Um, and I think both Jerry and I saw it as a hard case um, be because the public opinion was so galvanized about it uh, immediately, uh, but also one that just had the compelling elements that you see if, if you have seen the documentary on Netflix. So it's, it's where we both wanted to be. Yeah. Well, the great tragedy of Avery's life is very hard, in a sense, for us to comprehend, because what is it about this man, this family, in this community that caused this calamity to happen twice, wrongfully accused the first time, and if we're to be, you know, if we, if we think in that way, certainly very questionably convicted the second time. Why, well, why was Stephen Avery, do you think, the subject of so much hatred and focus in this community? Well, I, you know, his family um, is sort of uh, uh, clannish in some, you know, in some ways, um, easily identified as uh, part of an underclass um, in, in a rural county that's, that's not all that affluent anyways, where I think in many ways the, um, the class distinctions then become even more sharply drawn. Um, so some of it really was about uh, Stephen and locally, I think, lingering suspicions about whether he really was innocent um, of the 1985 case in spite of irrefutable uh, DNA evidence that not only cleared him but implicated the actual rapist um, or identified the actual rapist. And some of it, you know, was was about the family, I think, more broadly. Yeah. Um, well, it's hard to imagine that corrupt, corrupt cops actually planted a key in Avery's bedroom and that bullet in the garage. So however much they hated him. Um, from your time as a defense lawyer, how often it, does that happen? How often do you encounter suspicious evidence that might have been part of a framing? Suspicious evidence in the sense of, you know, physical evidence that you wonder whether it was planted there or moved uh, altered in some way. Not that often. Now, I don't know how often I miss it, um, but um, not that often. I think if you look a little bit more broadly about um, the ways in which police officers can succumb to temptation to augment a case dishonestly, um, so if you include exaggerated testimony or outright false testimony under oath, um, uh, deceptive police reports, and that's, that's a much more common um, phenomenon. I think anyone who works in the criminal justice system down at the, you know, at the case level um, bumps into that sort of a phenomenon um, more frequently than probably actual planting of evidence. So how possible is it that in the case of Stephen Avery, uh, a guilty man was also framed? 
I'm sorry, how? Is it possible with Stephen sure. Avery that a guilty man was sure. framed, that it was still Absolutely. bad you, evidence and planted on a man you, who actually did it? You can frame a guilty man just as easily as you, <laughs> as you can frame an innocent man. And indeed, in some ways, it's more likely um, in this sense. I, I think that it, it's, it's really an unusual and abandoned act of evil when a, a police officer sets out to frame someone he knows or believes to be innocent. The, the real temptation is when the police officer has a hunch or a belief or sort of an anticipation that the person is guilty and then harbors a fear that he'll somehow escape justice in spite of his guilt. That's where I think uh, the much more common you know, um, temptation or at least the succumbing to the temptation mm -hmm. arises to augment a case dishonestly. Sure. Well, if Stephen Avery and Brennan Dassey, uh, his nephew, who's also was been convicted, didn't murder Teresa Holbach, I mean, who did? I mean, uh, were there any other suspects in your mind and have anything happened since this airing of the TV show that has sort of surfaced new clues? Jerry Butin and I at the time identified four other possible suspects we thought, as to whom we thought there was a reasonably strong um, case that they may have been the, the actual culprit. Um, that evidence was not allowed by the trial judge. And so I, you know, I've never named uh, those people, but out of the field of possible third party culprits, we had narrowed it down to four. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's very provocative out there, you investigative journalists out there. Uh, I was personally really much more moved by the case of Brendan Dassey, the, the nephew, because, you know, he was 16 years old, uh, severely learning disabled, and neither his mother nor his attorney was present in the, in, in the interrogations. Do you come across that often, that such a person who was so, you know, had such a low IQ, so mentally challenged, it seemed to be such a clear sort of forced confession. Is that something that you encounter? Sure, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the people who are drawn in and accused in the criminal justice system disproportionately are uh, ill-equipped, uh, impoverished in a number of ways, not just financially, but impoverished intellectually, impoverished as a matter of, um, you know, their fund of general knowledge, uh, impoverished often emotionally or in terms of the support they've received from the people who should love them. Um, and, 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 you know, learning disabilities are very, are very common, um, it, it, both in juvenile justice and in the adult justice system. So the journey that, that people see Brendan undergoing through Wisconsin's criminal justice system is unfortunately not at all uncommon and indeed um, could you know, could be transplanted to almost any county or any city in the country. Mm. It's very, very heartbreaking to watch. And what is also heartbreaking to see is how inadequate his lawyer is. And, I mean, is it absolutely sort of just a given that a public defender can be this badly equipped to defend someone like Brendan Darcy? Well, he did not have a public defender right. uh, in the sense of, an, of somebody employed by the Wisconsin State Public Defender. <laughs> Uh, you know, as a state employee. He had court-appointed counsel because uh, in Wisconsin and, and everywhere, if there's an institutional public defender, that agency can't possibly handle all cases. There are conflicts of interest and there's just, you know, staffing um, shortage. So the slack, if you will, the excess is picked up in Wisconsin in most places by court-appointed counsel. Wisconsin is near, near the bottom in its compensation for court-appointed counsel. Um, $40 an hour hasn't gone up since 1994, and indeed it's only gone up $5 an hour since 1978. Um, and as I say, we're near the bottom, but, but not at the bottom, and this is a pervasive problem in United States justice, the undercompensation or underfunding of defense of the indigent, uh, because our, our courts survive on and thrive on the indigent. Um, you probably learned that you know more than 90% of people charged with a crime in this country haven't the money 
to pay for their own lawyer, let alone the other costs of defending themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, Stephen Avery memorably said on a prison phone call, the poor always lose. And it is a theme again and again that we hear at this summit. Have the odds gotten any better or any, or is it worse in the, la in the 30 years since you've practiced law that the poor always lose, as you're really saying now with the whole question of, for instance, bad lawyers because there's no money to pay them? Honestly, I, I have not perceived much change, uh, for better or worse. Um, that, that's depressing, um, but I, I really have not perceived much, m much change at all in the time I'm, I've been practicing. Now with court-appointed counsel, what's remarkable is that you get any good lawyers at all um, working for that money, and it says something for the pro bono tradition of the profession, it says something for the altruism of some of the people doing that work that they're doing it today in 2016 for the same $40 an hour that they would have made 22 years ago during, during the same case. That's really stunning. So why do you think the prosecutors are so unwilling to admit uh, wrongful convictions? You know, um, Brian Stevenson talks about a system that prioritizes finality over fairness. Uh, how does that culture get changed, that there is a much more uh, propulsive sort of instinct to just like close this case than there is to deliver fairness in the case? Well, the, you know, the finality really is a problem. It, it, it enjoys near primacy, I think, as, as a value in our system and needs to be demoted um, in, the, in the hierarchy of values. And there's no question, I think, under, quite understandably, just as a human matter, that police and prosecutors get invested in the correctness of the outcome. They don't want to get it wrong. They don't want to lock up an innocent person. And so there, I think there becomes an enormous personal need uh, to believe that you got it right, that you've not done a horrible injustice to somebody if you know, a lengthy prison term or even a short jail term um, is imposed. We also have an adversarial system, and lawyers want to win. We, you know, we all want to win. And it's easy to say at a forum or, you know, in, in a public speaking opportunity, it's easy for a prosecutor to say, well, of course, doing justice is my first obligation, and I try to honor that. But day to day, in the scrum of a courtroom, uh, with the, you know, the the 40 cases that this prosecutor will see called this morning and another 40 this afternoon, that can get lost. Um, and I think that there's a cynicism too that, that infects almost everyone um, in the criminal justice system where guilt is seen only in shades of gray and the, the hypothesis of innocence is, is very easily forgotten. Mm. Well, how do we make it more acceptable then to speak of redemption in our justice system? How do we change that culture? I, th I think it starts with humility um, for myself. I think it starts with, uh, with exactly that, um, sort of recognizing that every one of these institutions that together compose the criminal justice system are themselves made up only of human beings all of us flawed, all of us broken, and the system will reflect our flaws and our brokenness. It's inevitable. And so I think we need to have the humility to recognize that and to try to correct serious mistakes whenever we may discover them. And that's where the, the near primacy of finality becomes such uh, a barrier, and I think, um, a propagator of injustice mm -hmm. uh, in our system because it often takes a long time um, for a mistake to emerge and for the actors in the system uh, to gather the will to correct the mistake, acknowledge the wrong. And spend the money <clears throat> as well. Spend the money. Um, there's a lot of blaming that, that goes on as well that's not very helpful if you want people to acknowledge an error or mistake, the, 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 you know, the focus then on blaming somebody for the mistake rather than correcting the mistake in the first instance, I think itself becomes a barrier. 
Um, We've seen a lot of good things happening in criminal justice reform in the last uh, 12 months. What are three things that if you were able to fix them right now, you would say are the priorities to change and fix in the criminal justice system as it's broken now? Well, where, I'll tell you where I would start, um, and it's only a starting point, but it is where I'd start. Um, let's stop arrogating the godlike power to put people to death in our criminal justice system. You know, the, the United States long ago forfeited its opportunity to lead um, in the area of capital punishment. And at a minimum though now, maybe we ought to have the humility to at least follow every developed democracy in the world that has left the death penalty behind, left that brutal past behind, and we haven't. And that would be a good place to exercise some humility and at least to follow since we've, as I say, lost the opportunity to lead. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's a big one to change. Um, and maybe I've excluded number two and number three, but... Um, that's okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's get back just to Avery. What hope for Stephen Avery after this? I mean, given what you said about the difficulty in saying, I got it wrong. I mean, even at times with when there's DNA evidence, you find that you still can't extricate somebody from prison. Do you think that Stephen Avery could be extricated from prison? Brandon Darcy could now be extricated from prison, given what's gone down. They're in two, they're in two very different positions. We come back to Brian Stevenson's thoughts about finality. Um, Stephen Avery's direct appeal and his initial, at least collateral, attack are done. He's not in court, to put it in simple terms. So if there's hope for him, and there is some hope, um, it would lie, I think, in the area of newly discovered evidence. And that, you know, that may fall in a number of different subcategories, but that's, that's his realistic hope. Brendan Dassey, still, the nephew, is still in federal court on a collateral attack. That case has not been decided at the district court level, so he's in a, he's in a different uh, position. Mm -hmm. Right, well, thank you so much, Dean Strang. It's been an enormous pleasure to have you. We could talk for another half an hour, but I know you have a plane to catch, so thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. Today.